behold the majesty of gravity and inertia. Freeze, raccoon. How can I freeze when my heart warms at the very sight of you? Shut up, Ringtail. I have never played the Sly Cooper games. It was a series that never really interested me. I remember trying the Thieves in Time demo on PS3, but I couldn't tell you a thing about it. I figured that now that I'm permanently switching to UMD Fossil, I mean it this time. I mean it. From here on out, just Sony hardware. I know last year I switched to UMD Fossil. I said I was going to do PSP games. I did like one video. It was Daxter. Uh, this time I'm switching to UMD Fossil and I'm expanding the scope. Sony only. If the game doesn't exist, Sony hardware, I'm not covering it. I mean it this time. Anyway, I thought a good way to start UMD Fossil is to explore a beloved trilogy. Sly 1 through 3. Leaving Thieves and Time out for now. Before we get started, let's talk about the versions I am using for this review. I have all three Sly Cooper games for PS2. I decided to play them on my backwards compatible PS3. I know I could get the Sly Cooper Remastered Trilogy or just play them through an emulator with upscaling, but I wanted some authentic stank. The only changes I made is turning the smoothing option on and making it full screen. Well, most of the time. I did forget to toggle these options here and there, so if you see some changes in resolution, my bad. The point is, if you see some graphical infidelities, or this video comes out looking like you're watching it on an old crusty CRT in a dimly lit room, just consider it ambiance. Which by the way, this model PS3 sounds like a jet is flying. It's only while playing PS2 games as well. It pumps out so much heat that my room begins to feel like a sauna. Anyway, let's start off with the first entry in the series. Right away, Sly Cooper Thievius Raccoonus has a distinct, unique style. It doesn't take many screenshots or scenes to identify this game. Remove Sly from the equation and I still feel like I could recognize it. This is elevated by the fact that each level takes place in different parts of the world. Each boss has their own gimmick, which is foreshadowed throughout said levels. Take the first world, for instance, the Tides of Terror. Each world's considered an episode and you're greeted with these awesome title cards. It's as if you're a part of a noir serial or like the Batman animated series. But yes, the Tides of Terror. Right away, you know this is going to be related to the ocean in some way, then the introduction cutscene starts. The road trip gave me the time I needed to study up on Sir Raleigh the Frog. As a young man, this hot-tempered frog grew bored of his life of luxury and privilege. On a whim, he tried his hand at a bit of piracy and found it to his liking. Raleigh, who quickly became addicted to crime, was brought into the Fiendish Five as Chief Machinist, where his evil tinkering genius rose to new heights. The last reported sighting of this mad machinist was off the soggy coast of the Isle of Wrath, a small island uncomfortably situated in the middle of the perilous Welsh Triangle. Before you even begin to traverse the stage, you know that the areas are going to be pirate themed with a dash of British Isle references. It's simple, but extremely effective at world building. Throughout the game, there's all kinds of cool locations featured, like this fall at New Vegas Half-Life surface tension looking section. There's these poker tables, there's these old abandoned casinos, and these old cars, and everybody's gangsta themed, and I expected Dean Martin to come out and start singing Ain't That a Kick in the Head, it's, it's just awesome. I was pretty stoked about Kung Fu Panda Land, mostly due to this early 2000s snow. You know, snow is just awesome to see evolve throughout video games weather in general i feel like you know i don't want to do it but a good video would be comparing all the weather and all the games through the years i think it'd be fascinating to see also yeah stop typing i know this predates kung fu panda the point is is that thievius raccoonist is a visual feast i'm talking about these amazing visuals because well it's the best part of thievius raccoonist for me before the Sly fans light the torches and fetch the pitchforks, just know that 3D platformers ain't really my thing to begin with. There are a few I hold dear like Daxter, Mario 64, Psychonaut, Sonic Adventure if that counts, but generally speaking I avoid the genre like the plague. Keep this in mind because the issues I have with Sly 1 are all related to the gameplay and something that most platforming fans are just going to see as normal aspects of the genre. I've softened you up with the gushing of visual aesthetic, now it's time for my hot takes and, you know, 
general whiny babiness, I suppose. And don't worry, I'll have some good stuff to say as I go. I don't want to poop on Sly Cooper. It's not even remotely a bad game. Take the opening mission, for instance. It's a fantastic opener. When it's a fresh save, pressing start removes the main menu and puts the player directly in control. It's super cool to see, and I wasn't expecting it. It's kind of a staple through the series, but of course, starting from Sly 1, it's something you haven't seen yet. It's really cool. The mission itself is incredibly moody. You're on the rooftops of Paris, sneaking about in shrouded darkness. There's no enemies, no time limit, just free space to get oriented with the controls. This being a pre-2010s game, the controls are explained in-universe. Hey Bentley, I think I'm seeing things. Must be vertigo or something. Can you see those crazy blue lights? Really? I've read about this. Master raccoon thieves are able to sense thieving opportunities, which manifest themselves as unexplainable blue auras. Uh, according to my research, all you have to do is get near them and hold down the circle button and you should perform a super sneaky master thief move. Hold down the circle button near blue auras. I'm on it. You don't typically see this anymore unless it's being meme -y. Nowadays, it'll just be a screen prompt or a tutorial pop-up. Something is oddly nostalgic about Bentley telling Sly, hey man, press this button, and the whole thing is treated as if Sly is really pressing said button. Reminds me how first-person shooters had you looking around as if it was a monumental task that needs to be taught. Call of Duty's the first one that comes to mind, which had you looking at these posters. Then Halo 2 had you looking at lights, though at least that was sold as suit calibration, in a way to see if you needed to change your aiming to invert it, I suppose. Sly Cooper doesn't waste time trying to give an in-universe reason. Sly just be pressing circle, and for some reason I kinda miss this. The game doesn't take itself too seriously. I'm not sure why I read so deep into this. Maybe this is a cry for help. This screen is how 90% of the conversations go down. It's very Metal Gear Resident Evil 4. You can move their heads around with joysticks too, which is something, I guess. There's not much in the way of cutscenes besides the episode introductions and endings. Speaking of, the uninitiated may not know a single thing about this raccoon, so let's get the story out of the way. Once you creep along the previously mentioned Parisian rooftops, you break into a police station to retrieve a file. Upon this thievery, we are introduced to a character that probably spawned at least a few dozen furries. Criminal! You foolish raccoon. I've caught you red-handed. Ah, Carmelita. I haven't seen you since I gave you the slip in Bombay. Which reminds me, you need to return the Firestone of India to its rightful owners. Ah, uh, and I was going to give it to you as a little token of my... Hey, you know, that bazooka really brings out the color of your eyes. Very fetching. You think? This pistol packs a paralyzing punch. You ought to try it. Might snap you out of your crime spree. And give up our little rendezvous? Plenty of time for that once you're safely behind bars. Love to stick around and chat, but I just dropped by to pick up this case file. I think you've had it long enough. Once escaping Carmelita's Geneva Convention violating canon, you get the plot. Once again, my gang and I had given Inspector Carmelita Fox the slip. I was surprised to see how well she took it. Finally, the secret police file I'd been searching for all these years. With this, I could avenge my family and regain possession of our most valued treasure. It all began when I was just a kid, bouncing on my father's knee. You see, I come from a long line of master thieves who kept all their secrets of sneaking and stealing in an ancient book. The Thievius Raccoonus. Anyone who read it learned to be especially sneaky, which is why we specialize in stealing from criminals. After all, there's no honor, no challenge, no fun stealing from ordinary people. You rip off a master criminal, and you know you're a master thief. Well, on the night I was supposed to inherit the book, five visitors came unannounced to our door. My father fought to protect us, but the gang of villains known as the Fiendish Five overpowered him and ransacked our house until they found the Thievius Raccoonus. Our family's manual of thieving greatness fell into their filthy hands. They tore the book into five pieces and split it up, each villain disappearing to the farthest corners of the world to commit dastardly crimes. Broken alone, I was dumped at the town orphanage. There I met two guys who became my lifelong buddies and trusted crew. Bentley, techno genius and strategist supreme, and Murray, part-time driver and full-time burden. Together we pledged to track down the Fiendish Five, avenge my father, and steal back the Thievius Raccoonus. I knew I was about to face the toughest test of my life. On this mission, I would either become a master thief like my ancestors before me, or fail and allow my family name to bite the dust. 
Yep, it's an origin story about revenge. Don't get me wrong, I wasn't expecting Metal Gear Solid or Red Dead Redemption, it's just that Sly's motive is so cliché that I had little if any investment. After the prologue, you were introduced to the hideout. Bentley acts as a place to watch all the cutscenes. Not uncommon for this pre-YouTube era. Murray's just blocking the next episode. This HQ is pretty cool because the episodes start as maps, and once completed, they're filled with all kinds of loot. Now it's time to talk about the level structures. The beginning of each episode starts with an infiltration. Sly Cooper's very linear, with little to no alternate paths. It's reminiscent of the original Crash Bandicoot. The only way is forward. When I say I don't like 3D platformers, typically this is what I mean. To me, it's just boring. It doesn't help that Sly Cooper in itself is a little brutal. You can only take one hit, fall in the water once, fall in the void once, get vaporized by lasers once. You get one try to land your jumps or kill the enemies or you're getting booted back to the checkpoint. There's also a live system. Lose those lives and you're getting booted back to the beginning of the stage. There's a little bit of forgiveness with horseshoes. You can find these throughout the levels or earn them by collecting 100 coins. A horseshoe means you can take a hit or recover from missing a jump. You get gold horseshoes that allow up to two mistakes. Since I sucked at this game, I can tell you for sure that dying a few times in a row in the same spot grants you horseshoes. The game was literally taking pity on me at times. Contrast this with the easy boss fights and I had a weird experience. I'd struggle to get those final showdowns only to breeze through them, with the exception of Ruby. She has this nightmare dance dance revolution mechanic and it makes me want to throw my dual shock across the room. It wasn't until one of my friends told me that you can spam these buttons. Like you don't have to hit them right when they come to slide. You could be sitting there tapping triangle till the cows come home and then when it passes you can do the same thing to whatever notes next. That makes it 10 times easier, but I didn't know that the first time, and I about lost my mind. As for things to collect, other than the previously mentioned coins, you got these messages in a bottle. Collect them all on a level, and you can unlock a safe to get upgrades. I did not unlock a single safe the entire playthrough. I either couldn't find them all, or I got sick of dying or losing horseshoes trying to retrieve them. You don't need these upgrades to beat the game, but I'm sure they'd help. From what I gather from wikis, the upgrades include stuff like slowing down time. It could have helped me. But regardless, I still beat the game in roughly six hours. They aren't required, but the completionists out there should have a blast tracking them down. Completing the levels involve grabbing a treasure key. I absolutely love that animation, that's why I used it at the start, because, you know, it's so cool. These keys are basically like the signs of Sonic or the nukes of Duke Nukem. Reaching them ends the level, no questions asked. They are required to progress, so it's not like you can skip them. After the initial infiltration, you arrive to the episode's hub world. There's these enemies that'll one-shot you if you're caught in their flashlights. They're also present within the levels. They're frequent enemies in more stealthy segments. There's some light exploration of the world that may lead you to some extra lives, but besides that, this is a glorified level select with sprinkled enemies. Alright, so there's three types of levels, right? There's the standard 3D platforming affair. Snooze fast for someone like me. There's the boss fights, which, you know, are kind of self-explanatory. Each boss has its own fight and gimmick. And what I do like about these is the health bar. The lower it gets, their faces change. It kind of reminds me of Doom Guy. Uh, just a small little detail I like. But the boss fights are they're, they're, they're boss fights. And then you got the miserable, absolutely miserable, terrible, awful mini game slash gimmick levels whatever you want to call them. so to mix up the game the developers thought oh let's have a racing stage that is disgustingly floaty you play as sly cooper 95 percent of the time bentley's basically your mission briefing slash tutorial dude murray has absolutely nothing to do he's the one who drives the van so the devs to like give him something he, they decided to, like, give him these races. They begin as nice comedic moments as Murray ends up in these races by accident. While Sly and Bentley on a mission, Murray sees some kind of food stand, which leads to some goons offering him a race. The issue is that the racing is miserable. The physics are super unforgiving. You need the boost power-ups, but the AI can take them as well. And they don't even use them. They just break them, so you can't have them. It's so frustrating. It's like a giant middle finger. What makes this worse is the second race. You see, in the first one, your opponents all have unique vehicles. It adds some character to an otherwise tacked-on minigame. However, the second one features carbon copies of one car. It saps the little character that was there and creates an even more generic atmosphere. These races are required and you have to finish first, so have fun trying them over and over again. 
The only other thing Murray gets is this like miserable escort mission. Every now and again, you have these turret sections where you have to protect Murray from enemies until he reaches a treasure key. And in fact, there's actually one with Sly where you're using Carmelita. Uh, a bit of a bit of a long story there. Yeah, they become temporary allies in the moment. It's not important. But anyway, half the problem was that I haven't aimed with a controller in a very long time, so being precise was a little difficult. It matters, too, because there is friendly fire. Hitting Murray or letting the enemies hit him means you got to do it all over again. It's pretty s slow and boring, so hope that you do it on the first try so you don't have to start it all over again. Speaking of turrets, there's also these twin stick shooter minigames. First time I came across one, I got a little excited. Until, again, failing them means starting from the very beginning. It doesn't help that some of them get very busy. Going in blind means you'll probably have to repeat earlier sections multiple times because you will die due to not knowing where enemies will be coming from. What makes these mini games so bad is how long they last. The first twin sticks shooter has you shooting these chests. Wow, say that three times fast. You have to shoot 40 chests and they require sustained fire to collect. If one of these crabs take one, then you gotta do all over again. 40 is just too much. It lasts forever. Then there's this one mini game where you have to run over these fish to get oil, so you're gonna light these torches, and uh, all under a pretty tight time limit. You know what? I hate it. That's the point. It sucks. All right, now I got that on my system. Because of these mini games gimmick levels, I really never want to play Sly One again, and that may be a tad dramatic. But if you haven't lit the tiki torches, then you don't have no room to talk. That's all I'm saying. When it works, it's a very smooth, awesome experience. With a disappearing HUD, the whole game has a very immersive aspect. Like, yeah, it's a raccoon fighting ghosts, but I was still able to get lost in the world. Unfortunately, either I suck, or the controls suck, or both. I swear there was times I was slamming on the circle button and I'd still fall. I can't tell you how many times I game over. I don't know. For some reason, I, I still found the game to be boring. And I was kind of glad it was over. <laughs> Regardless, Sly 1 is still an amazing game. I mean, I never want to touch it again, but that's due to personal taste, not due to the game being objectively bad or anything like that. At least I got to see the final cutscene for the first time naturally. <laughs> Who could ever forget the lovely Carmelita? Looks like we're not going to be friends anymore. Now that Clockwork's death ray is out of commission, we're back to playing cops and robbers. I thought for sure she was going to slap the handcuffs on me right then and there. But instead, she was true to her word and gave me that 10 second head start. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. One. Oh, sly, you sly dog, you. Speaking of, did you know that in Europe, Sly Cooper is called Sly Raccoon? It's kind of weird, isn't it? And fun fact of the day. Anyway, that's Sly Cooper 1, so let's move on to the next game, Sly 2. Oh my god, it's Band of Thieves, baby. I'm going to go ahead and say it. Sly Cooper 2 Band of Thieves is a masterpiece. Where was this game my whole life? Oh, I know why, because I swore off the genre. I rarely tried 3D platformers. Sly 2 makes me want to visit all the platformers I ignored just to make sure there's not something I'm missing out. Like, there might be something glorious I'll enjoy. I mean, I'm, not, I'm probably going to hate 90% of them, but maybe there is something like Sly 2 where I'll just fall in love with it. Uh, to be honest, I have little to no complaints about Sly 2. I mean, there's a few nitpicks here and there, but for the most part, I consider this a new all-time favorite. Definitely in, like, my top 30, 40, 50 games. I don't know. Pick one. I like it. I finished Sly 1, then immediately booted up 2, and the visuals right away were an impressive upgrade. There's a lot more details, too, such as this awesome split-second scene where you're running along this, like, cable over bustling traffic. To use an overused phrase, the world feels lived in. It's like the adventures of the Cooper gang are actually occurring among an unsuspecting public. While the first game felt like you might as well been on another planet and the only characters involved were the, the Sly Cooper characters, you know? And the best part about all this is we get to play as THE Murray, unironically my favorite character. Running 10 feet tires him out and he punches the living hell out of enemies. You also throw living enemies into a water pipe 
to clog it with their drowning corpses to blow a door open. It is metal as hell, dude. Then you get to play as Bentley, right? Who is also brutal. You put enemies to sleep with a dart and then you casually drop a grenade beside them. This is insane. This is like putting enemies to sleep in Metal Gear just to shoot them in the face. I kind of don't want to spoil this game further as the plot is absolutely fantastic. Instead of the story being very predictable like the first game, you know, going through each world to defeat a boss, to get a page of the Thievius Raccoonus, rinse and repeat, Sly 2 has an evolving plot where each episode's truly different in its motive and objective. Even the repeat goals of Retrieve This Plot Driven Artifact have a different chain of events leading to nabbing said artifact. I feel like I can't explain this without some slight spoilery, so I'm going to spoil a few details. So I'll say this, slide 2 is fantastic and worth your time. It took me about 13 hours to beat so it can be experienced rather quickly. It will not waste your time. Stop the video here and go play it if you want to experience it spoil free. I went and skipped to the third game in this video as there is a detail that kind of maybe spoils too, and also I kind of don't talk about 3 that much. I kind of poop all over it because I don't like 3. So yeah, thanks for watching up to this point. And let me know what else you'd like to see from UND Fossil. Let me know what kind of Sony game you'd like to see. And um, but yeah, go play Sly 2. It's well worth your time. If you're still here, I'm going to try to limit the plot details so there's still some surprises. But we'll see how good I am at that. The plot is that various pieces of clockworks is... The plot is that various pieces of clockwork is... Clockwork... The plot is that the various pieces of Clockworks is The plot is that various pieces of Clockworks is corpse. Man, Clockwork? Clockworks is Clockworks is corpse. Uh, the plot is that you get various pieces of Clockwork. His corpse. I'm not sure how to say this without sounding like a dumb redneck. Anyway, you take pieces of his dead body. Carmelita and this new furry generator, Constable Neal, are trying to hunt down these parts. In a very creative fashion, the clockwork parts are being used practically. The tail feathers, for instance, are used to counterfeit currency. It's actually ingenious and uh, amazing to see this kind of creativity in a story like this. I kind of chuckled at this and smiled at the same time. It's not another revenge story or a standard hunt down the bad guy affair. This story actually has a bit of a spider web going on in terms of plot details and whatnot i mean again don't expect red dead redemption or metal gear but it, it has some cool stuff as said before you get the ability to play as bentley and murray which adds a whole new layer to the game you see the previous hub worlds have been replaced with a bigger more populated alternative they remind me of sonic adventure one hub worlds except here there are enemies wandering around the messages in the bottles return and except this time it gives you an excuse to explore the map and you end up finding some pretty cool little areas or find these little nooks and crannies you didn't know existed. There's even loot to find and return to the safe house to collect more money. Oh yeah, money. Instead of granting you horseshoes, now you can buy gadgets, which are additional moves. There's tons of them, and most of them are useful, but kind of like Sly 1, you can beat the game without them. However, this time it really does truly help immensely. When traversing these open areas of Sly, you can smoothly jump from rooftop to rooftop due to his endless array of abilities. However, when using Bentley or Murray, it creates a different experience. They cannot run along cables or hop on small points or anything smooth like that. It's small, but really keeps the gameplay diverse as you have to find alternate ways to get to your destinations. There's a moment where your plan is just Bentley, and it's such an awesome diversion. You start the episode just using him. Not only does Bentley experience his own character arc, but you get the struggle of navigating a new, vast, open environment as a turtle who can't parkour. There's no immediately getting to the high ground to survey the area and plotting your route. It makes it a little difficult and almost feels like a fish out of water scenario, like you're at a disadvantage. Then when you get to move about the area slide, it almost changes the landscape since now you're able to take routes you couldn't before. The map didn't change, but your perspective did, meaning the same exact area has a brand new feeling. I could be reading way too deep into it, but I can't help but gush over this little detail. Details. Sly 2 has such amazing details. I've been saying it since the start of this segment because it's true. Take this dancing sequence where Sly and Carmelita are distracting this tiger as Murray steals the clockwork wings and playing eyesight. There's so many awesome moments that I don't want to continue to spoil. So instead, let's talk about the gameplay changes a little more in depth. I'm going to stick to episode 1 and 2 as much as possible, but know that the stakes get higher leading to more complex heists. 
The start of each episode begins with a briefing. Throughout the episode, Bentley will update the crew on the actions that they need to take to acquire whatever it is the team is there to steal. It's very Grand Theft Auto V. Unlike the first game, Band of Thieves truly feels like a stealthy heist. You have to take recon photos and perform sabotage missions all without being seen. There's even a pickpocket mechanic now, which is required to get keys to unlock stuff like a castle door. The bosses are treated like actual baddies as you have to avoid them. Like they, Their presence is menacing and you cannot just interact with them right away. While Sly 1 guards felt like they were hiding behind an army of men. And then when you finally attack them, it seems like they're almost being desperate. Here, they're out walking around doing whatever they want because Sly can't take them out right away. They need to be weakened or they need to be backed into a corner or whatever, you know. You do have a health bar now, so the game isn't as unforgiving. Enemies take a few more hits, but when they die, you get a satisfying... Some real Adam West stuff. Besides that, though, the combat isn't too expanded. You do have a stealth takedown now, which is cool. It's a way to take out the flashlight enemies and whatnot. Of course, you got your action-packed missions, like using Bentley's RC chopper to blow dudes up by dropping bombs, which is an accurate prediction of the future of warfare. There's also kill-all-the-dudes-type moments that serve as a heart accelerator to change pace from the usual sleuthing. Every now and again, you get a gimmick level that is done much better than those in the first game. Generally, the game is paced in a way where you won't see the same style of mission back-to-back. -back. Sure, there's repeats, but they're pretty far apart. Sly 2 is amazing, and everyone should play it. Unlike the first game, you truly feel like a stealthy thief, and it's really amazing to see the whole Cooper gang putting in the work. I've probably left loads out, as this part of the video is probably shorter than Sly 1, but that's in part due to the fact that I want everyone to naturally experience the twists and turns Sly 2 takes. The story made this game for me. There were roadblocks, drama, character arcs, and overall kind of felt like a comedic, child-friendly Bond film. I don't think I would have liked it as much if it carried over the generic revenge plot from the first game. Now, without much further ado, time for Sly Cooper 3. I'm sorry to say this, Sly 3 fans, but I was massively disappointed with Sly 3. Honor Among Thieves is... Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I think it has to do with the fact I play these games back-to-back. -back. Sly 2 was such a huge improvement over 1 that I half expected the same kind of leap to 3. However, what I got was an action-packed, mini-game-heavy, boring cutscene snooze fest. I swear to God, this, this game has so many cutscenes, it could be Sly Cooper 4, Guns of Patriots. Sly 1 and 2 had dark maps with Sly slinking in the shadows. Sly 3 has so many bright areas or just being in the broad daylight in general. It no longer feels like a stealth game or a James Bond movie in my opinion. There's new characters that lead into some interesting dialogues. Okay, Penelope, I'm in a position with your hover spectrometer. I'll launch the device and you scan for metal structures that resemble a safe or chest. Anything the treasure map might be stored in. Roger, Bentley. Let's light this candle. Be still, my heart. She made an obscure NASA reference. Why do the girls always have to go for Sly? It's just not fair. What was that? I didn't reach you. Oh, nothing. I was just saying that we've got fair winds for liftoff. This Lafui guy is really on it. He must have seen the desk and raised all the bridges to the floor. There's no way in. I've dealt with guys like this before. They can't really trust their own men, so they always keep an escape route handy. You just have to look around a little. Wow, Sly's really taught you a lot. Sly? We're a team. In case you haven't noticed, I'm the brains of the operation. He's just a field man. Just the field, man. Sounds like you're jealous. Well, yeah, I, I wish I wasn't in this chair. I wish I could run on tight ropes and jump on flag poles and all that stuff, but I can't. You can do other stuff. Sly can't rewire a satellite or write ASCII code. Sly can't even spell ASCII. Yeah, he's not the most technical guy. Hey, let's get moving. We won't find the back entrance just standing around. In general, this game has a more Ocean's Eleven cinematic appearance and tone, but it falls short of the titan that is Sly 2. I guess I should give some examples, but Sly 3 does have 
some twists and turns. So I'm going to be fair like I was with Sly 2 and say that I won't spoil the whole plot. So really, let's just talk about the prologue, episode 1, 2, and I'm going to mention the 5th. Um, I'm going to spoil a little bit just to explain kind of the, the dynamic of this game. But there there is a pretty interwebbed plot, even if it isn't as good as Sly 2. So I'll try not to spoil stuff. When the game starts, you are assaulting an island that houses a vault. But not just any vault, it's the Cooper Vault. All the treasures the Cooper family amassed in one impenetrable vault door. The only key is Sly's cane. There's other members helping the Cooper gang invade this little island. Their silhouettes hide their identities, but due to their voices, I picked up on some of the characters right away. I was wondering why hide their identities, but that's because, uh-oh, it's the future. Yeah, at the end of this mission, you go back in time. It, flashbacks, whoa. I hate when video games or movies do this. We know that the game will lead to this island now. We know that there's going to be new members helping the Cooper gang. Bentley and Murray are alive and well. I don't know, I may be dramatic in this, but I feel like flashbacks kill all tension. Because now we know everything up until that point works out. Everything's gonna be alright. So yeah, the story is that Sly has to recruit a lot of help in order to get the Cooper Vault and open it so Sly can retire. Enter Bentley's Thirst Trap. And of course, hello Carmelita again. Which brings me to episode 1, which is Venice. It is here that I knew Sly 3 would be a worse too. For starters, the hub world seem a little bigger, except there's no message in the bottles. This is something that doesn't affect me too hard because I never hunted them all down, but it does remove the one reason to explore the map, especially since loot is also missing. So the only way to earn cash is by like breaking furniture and killing dudes and pickpocketing. So yeah, now the hub worlds, they, they should have just been glorified mission selects because there's just nothing to do in these worlds. But hey, not a big, not a big deal, right? Not a big missing feature. So you know, maybe maybe that doesn't kill the whole game. Well, back in Sly 2, there's this mission where you're playing as Murray and Sly is also with you. And the objective is to protect Bentley as he's hacking something. It's a hectic mission with tons of enemies coming at you. It feels like a tense struggle. Here's the same kind of mission in Sly 3, but this time it's just Sly and Bentley. It's worse. You're getting one enemy at a time. And it's just not hectic whatsoever. Remember me gushing about the Sly and Carmelita dancing too? I didn't give much details and not spoil things, but it's a Simon Says thing while there's all sorts of things happening in the background with occasional conversations between the villains. Here's the same kind of thing in 3. The goal is Bentley is doing a singing battle with the villain of this episode while Sly takes a sweet time getting ready to drop a chandelier or whatever on said villain. It's less interesting, less stylistic, less bondish, and it lasts way, way too long and is very boring. Speaking of things being longer, Sly 3 has the same issues as his first game with stuff just being near endless feeling. You get to use Carmelita in the first episode shooting at flying dudes. The enemies take a ton of hits and you have to bring a stupid amount of them down. Also, I'm not sure where to put this in the video, so I'll say it here, but Sly 3 came with a pair of 3D glasses. Mine didn't, because it was the only copy I could find in my local game store. But there's these missions that allow you to select 3D if you wanted, and if your TV supported it, so you could see the game in 3D, which I bet was pretty crap, honestly. Also, Sly 3 has a multiplayer mode that I have no footage of, because I forgot it existed till now. But yeah, who, who wants to come over and eat some Little Caesars and play some Sly 3, and then play better games afterwards? Anybody? Anybody up for that? Episode 2 is the worst episode across all three games. The map is boring. The gimmick levels suck, such as this one where you gotta flip the truck to collect red scorpions. Like, who thought of this? There's this claw level where you protect these energy stands. Like, you pick up the enemies and throw them. And you gotta drop these flint rocks down so Murray can shoot them across to light the oil on fire. And then, like, you got the guru, who's uh, kind of a, a pacifist, so you have to, like, control the enemies to run them into stuff to break them as a loophole in violence, you know? It's, 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 I hate this game so much. The only good part about Sly 3 is Episode 5, and it's because it's like a prototype Assassin's Creed Black Flag. And all this really does is just piss me off that the pirate genre is so under-tapped. Like, I want to see a Thieves game where it's PvE. Or, or or even something like this. It could be a kid's game. Or, or just give me another black flag. I just want more pirate sailing games. Please! Alright, I don't want to talk about Sly 3 anymore. Uh, so we're just not gonna. <laughs> I, I really don't like Sly 3. And doing some light research, it seemed like that game got rushed. 
out pretty quick. I mean, there was only a year between those games when there was two years between Sly 1 and 2. But I know that a lot of people love all these games and it's part of their childhoods. And I just want to say that um, I can see the appeal and see how great these games could be and kind of hate that I skipped over them all these years because Kid Me probably would have loved to even now. But it does make me want to revisit some platformers and see if there's one hidden. But yeah, I'm switching to UMD Fossil. As said, and uh, this was the first video, uh, unless you want to count Daxter from last year. And uh, yeah, that was fun. It was a good video. You know, I read that Sly Cooper 1 like, had a hard time selling really well, but it still sold like 400,000 copies or whatever. But I think it's because in the U.S. we got this like really lame cover. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty lame. I mean, you compare that to, to 2. Yeah, two's cover's pretty cool. I don't know, just something I thought about.